Have you ever wondered why mountains seem so still and silent? Well, prepare to be amazed because these majestic landforms have some hidden talents. You see, mountains are actually quite the performers. They have their own unique songs and dance routines. What does it mean and how does it work? Well, let's see. Get ready for a chilling revelation. Mount Everest has a secret nighttime symphony, and this mysterious music will send shivers down your spine. When darkness falls over the Himalayas, a strange eerie chorus echoes through the glaciers surrounding the majestic peak. A team of researchers embarked on a quest to unravel the mystery. Led by the glaciologist Evgeny Podolsky, they trekked through the freezing temperatures of the Nepalese Himalayas. Their goal? To uncover the source of these hair-raising noises. The team was amazed by the incredible size and beauty of Mount Everest. During the day, the weather was nice and they could work comfortably. However, when night came, it became extremely cold, reaching temperatures as low as minus 5 degrees Fahrenheit. At that moment, something interesting happened. The ice on the mountain started to break apart and make loud booming sounds that echoed through the valley. To solve the mystery, the team used advanced technology that is typically used to measure earthquakes. They placed sensors on the surface of the glacier and listened to the vibrations it created. They also looked at information about temperature and wind. By comparing all of this data, they made a very important and exciting discovery. The culprit behind this frozen orchestra? It's the sudden decrease in temperature. The icy surface of the glacier is very sensitive to these changes, causing it to crack and split with loud booming noises. This discovery helps scientists understand how glaciers behave in a world where climate change is becoming more pronounced. This adventure is really important because it gives scientists who study glaciers and the climate in faraway places like the Himalayas very valuable information. The melting of glaciers in that area is happening really fast. And that's a big problem. It's a serious threat to South Asia. A recent research shows that the glaciers have been melting 10 times faster in the past 40 years compared to the previous 700 years. But this isn't the only reason why mountains can make strange noises. Other mountains might also sing their own songs. For example, Mount Matterhorn. Guess what? Everything around us has its own special rhythm. Objects vibrate at certain frequencies because of their shape and what they're made of. You've probably seen it before with tuning forks and wine glasses. When they're hit with the right frequency, they start shaking and making sounds. But here's something cool. Even mountains have their own groove. They vibrate in their own unique way. Jeffrey Moore and his team of adventurous scientists wanted to find out if mountains can dance to their own music just like bridges and tall buildings. They thought that the special shapes of mountains might make them vibrate at certain frequencies, which is called resonance. But testing this idea wasn't easy. Unlike buildings that engineers can shake or bridges that vehicles can drive over, mountains are massive and hard. It's hard to make them move on purpose. Not giving up, Moore and his team took on a big project. They wanted to study how the shaking of the earth affected the famous Matterhorn Mountain. This incredible mountain is located on the border of Italy and Switzerland. It looks like a pyramid. It's really tall, reaching about 15,000 feet high. It has four sides facing north, south, east, and west. With the help of helicopters, the scientists put special devices called seismometers in specific places on the mountain. One was placed at the very top and used solar power to work. It was as small as a coffee cup. Another seismometer was tucked beneath the floorboards of a cozy hut on the mountain, and a third one was placed at the base of the mountain to compare the measurements. Together, they were the tiny observers that kept recording the movements of the mountain all the time. And they finally detected it. Even though the mountain's movements are incredibly small, scientists discovered that the Matterhorn gently sways back and forth about once every two seconds. What's truly surprising is that the top of the mountain moves up to 14 times more than its base. The Eiffel Tower kind of does the same thing. This giant iron structure is a pro at handling windy days, and when a storm blows through, it's not afraid to show off its swaying skills. It's like the tower is saying, hey wind, bring it on. But the reason behind the mountain's movement isn't just wind, as it may seem. So, 
Why do mountains do that? Why do they dance and make a humming sound? Are they having a party that we're not invited to? Well, it's all because of something called seismic energy. When earthquakes happen in different parts of the world, their energy travels through the earth and causes the mountains to vibrate. The oceans also join in this mountain music. When waves move across the ocean floor, they create vibrations called microseisms. It's like the earth's own heartbeat, felt all around the world. And guess what? The frequency of these vibrations matches the way the Matterhorn sways. It's like the mountain and the oceans are chilling together. So the next time you see a mountain, remember that it's not just standing still, it's actually part of a global symphony created by the Earth itself. This research helps us learn how earthquakes can affect steep mountains that are prone to landslides and avalanches. It also gives us a new way to appreciate mountains like the Matterhorn. They have their own hidden songs, swaying and vibrating to a mysterious melody deep within the Earth. But there's one more pretty cool thing about the mountains. They don't just talk themselves. They may also influence the way we talk. Turns out, languages spoken in high altitude areas have special sounds that you won't hear elsewhere. After studying 567 languages, linguists found that 92 of them use a special kind of sound called ejectives. These sounds are made by pushing air out forcefully from the back of the throat. This creates bursts of speech that give these languages their distinctiveness. Scientists were really surprised by this connection. These sounds, like a strong K and Ka, are not common in English or European languages. But some indigenous languages in North America and the area between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea have them. What's even more puzzling is that Tibetan languages, spoken in mountains, don't use adjectives. Linguists are curious to unravel this mystery and learn more about how mountains and language are connected. So, why do some languages spoken in the mountains have special sounds? Well, it's a bit of a mystery. Researchers have some cool ideas. One idea is that these sounds might help people keep their throats from getting dry when they talk in the dry air of the mountains. Another idea is that the lower air pressure up there makes it easier to make these sounds. But scientists are still figuring out the real reason. Although some experts are not entirely convinced by this explanation. They say that while geography can influence language, there are other reasons why languages might be similar. Like borrowing words from nearby languages or being close to each other. But this research has still given us some amazing insights. Mountains not only shape the way our world looks, but they also shape the way we talk. So the next time you're exploring a mountainous area, listen carefully to the local language. You might hear unique sounds and words that are influenced by the mountains themselves. It's like nature is sharing its own special secrets through the language of the people who live there. And remember that the mountains themselves also have a voice, and they're speaking to us in their own special way. Scientists are still on an exciting adventure to uncover their secrets. So let's see what are some cool things they'll find out in the future. Stay tuned. It was 29,002 feet in 1954. 22 years later, it grew by 27 feet. In 1999, the top was 7 feet higher. In 2020, it was 3 feet less than that. What gives? Mount Everest is still the tallest mountain in the world, even though its height is constantly changing. It had been measured for the first time long before anyone even climbed it. In the 19th century, there used to be this thing called a theodolite, the grandfather of mechanisms engineers and land surveyors use today. It measured the angles between two horizontal points. After that, it would go with basic trigonometry to measure where the third point is and how distant it is. That's how mountains are measured. It was complicated because people who measured it had to know where sea level is. Now, there's no sea near the Himalayas which is why surveyors had to walk all the way from the Bay of Bengal to do the measuring. Others who tried to measure Everest later got similar results, but never the same. Sea level is constantly going up or down because of changes happening on Earth, so it's not easy to be that precise. Mount Everest is part of the Himalayan mountains, and the whole chain is getting taller by around one-fifth of an inch a year. The tectonic collision that created the Himalayas in the first place started 50 million years ago, and it's still going on. That causes growth, but also brings earthquakes that are in charge of reducing its height. So the information from older geography books may not be accurate these days. 
Mount Everest is the tallest mountain, but only compared to those measured above sea level. There's Mauna Kea volcano in Hawaii, and if you measure from its underwater base, it's 4,000 feet taller than Everest. Antarctica actually has several time zones, nine of them to be precise. The Great Wall of China. Nope, it can't be seen from space. Sure, sometimes you can identify it when in lower Earth orbit, but at these heights, you can see many structures built by civilization. For example, the Great Pyramids of Giza. When on the moon, you can see some green vegetation and a beautiful, mostly white sphere, lots of blue, and patches of yellow. Nope. Oh no, you swallowed a gum accidentally. <laughs> no worries, your body won't need 7 years to digest it. It's a myth our parents told us to stop us from swallowing gums. Your body can't digest the ingredients found in gums, so it'll simply move it along. You don't swallow 8 spiders a year while sleeping. Spiders, luckily, don't care about humans, and they don't have any prey or something else that might interest them in your bed. They see you as some kind of a big rock. The air coming from your mouth is creating vibrations that will stop them from trying to get into your mouth. A popular story that famous physicist Albert Einstein failed math in school isn't exactly true. He failed in botany, zoology, and language sections at an entrance exam to a school in Zurich. He was always great at math. Boy, I sure wasn't. It never added up for me. Humans and dinosaurs never really coexisted. They missed each other by over 60 million years. Oil won't prevent pasta from sticking. If you like adding oil, feel free to, but it will only make pasta greasier. Stir it to stop it from clumping. You only use 10% of your brain, or not. You never use 100% of your brain all at once, but you use every region almost every day. Your brain needs to work at full capacity all the time because that's something that keeps you alive. Bananas don't grow on trees. They are big herbs that resemble trees. Pineapples grow from the center of a leafy plant that's on the ground. Goldfish may not be the smartest animal ever, but their memory is longer than 3 seconds. It's up to 3 months, which isn't a lot, but enough for it to remember your 3 wishes. Shaving won't thicken your hair. It'll grow the same as it was. You may only think it's darker or coarser because the hair will grow back with a blunt tip. Coffee lovers, don't worry. Caffeine won't dehydrate you. It does have a diuretic effect, but still, the amount of water in your coffee has the opposite effect. So, you're good. You won't damage your eyes if you're too close to the TV screen. That blue light coming from it causes strain in your eyes, but it's a temporary condition. Dogs see more than black and white. They can't see the full color spectrum as humans do, but the world is not a couple of shades of gray for them. They have around 20 to 40% of visual acuity humans have, so distant things may be pretty blurry for pups. But they see better in dimmer light and can detect motions or any kind of movements way better than you do, especially when the delivery guy is approaching the front door. Bees aren't only attracted to yellow out of all shades, they also see colors a little bit different than humans. They recognize only lighter ones, such as green or yellow. All darker colors look black to them. That's why they're more likely to go for flowers with light colors and clothes of the same tones. If you're wearing a green t-shirt, you might look like a flower to them. Almost all creatures on Earth have a limited lifespan. One species of jellyfish is immortal. It matures, but at one point it simply reverts back to the juvenile polyp stage. That cycle of phases is endless. There are many types of berries, but a strawberry is not one of them. Scientists define berry as a plant with three distinct layers. There's an outer skin, a fleshy middle, and internal seeds. That means watermelon, grapes, and eggplants are technically berries. Polar bears aren't really white. They have black skin, and their fur is clear and hollow. They only look white because light hits their fur and stays trapped inside of that hollow part of a particular hair. That causes something called luminescence. With all that, salt particles stick to their fur and then start scattering light. If you set a chameleon on a yellow surface, it'll turn yellow. If you set it on a red one, it'll turn red. In fact, chameleons don't change their own color to adjust to the color of their surrounding. Their mood, the amount of light, and temperature makes them change color. So when you see a bright yellow chameleon, it might be angry. Giraffes have the same number of neck vertebrae as you do. 
An average human neck is only 4 inches long, while giraffes usually have a 6-foot neck. But both have 7 bones in their necks. Pirates don't have eye patches to cover an eye that's missing, but to increase their night vision. They had to be aware of everything going on around them. So... Many think it's just a dry desert with nothing but sand over there. But research shows there's definitely water on Mars. Scientists found big saltwater lakes under the ice at the planet's south pole. Bats are not blind. Their eyes are small and they don't see that well during the daytime, especially not so sharp and colorful as humans do. But their vision is adapted to different conditions and is excellent during the nighttime, unlike ours. Black holes aren't invisible. A black hole is a very compact and huge object that has an extremely powerful gravitational pull. So strong, even light can't avoid it. The swallowing center is something scientists call the event horizon. It's surrounded by a glowing circle made of rock, debris, and space dust, so it can be seen pretty well. Scientists even got the first pictures of it. Despite what the name says, Iceland is not really covered with ice. The coast is ice-free during the entire winter. There are glaciers, but also lots of geysers and active volcanoes. In 2010, one of them woke up and threw up so much ash into the sky, air transport across Europe had to be stopped for a couple of days. Green peas, lentils, peanuts. Wait, peanuts? Yep, that's right. They don't belong to the group of nuts, but legumes. Moon has a dark side. Not quite. The side that's facing away from the Earth is no darker than any other part of its surface. Sunlight equally falls on all of its sides, so it only seems to be dark from our perspective. The Himalayas have some of the highest peaks in the world, including Mount Everest. But it's no surprise airplanes find it difficult to navigate the area. But why are commercial airplanes actually banned from flying there? For starters, these mountains have an average height of more than 20,000 feet. Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the entire world, stands at 29,037 feet high above sea level. The area is rough, filled with snow, and has almost no flat surfaces. In case of sudden cabin depressurization, it would be really difficult to perform an emergency landing since there's literally no flat area there. More so, the low oxygen environment at such an altitude means there's likely to be a lot of turbulence. Not only is it really unpleasant for passengers, but random air movements and high wind velocity means that it's really difficult to maneuver the airplane. This area is also quite low populated, so there's not much there in terms of radar systems. And radar is crucial for aviation safety. Without radars, pilots would be unable to communicate with the ground to figure out flight conditions. It can also get so cold up there that jet fuel might completely freeze. Sure, the fuels used in airplanes usually freeze at around negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit, but it may be possible above Everest. The lowest temperature was recorded there back in December 2004, when thermometers showed a staggering minus 44 degrees Fahrenheit. So, no wonder pilots don't want to ever take that risk, especially on a commercial flight. Among the few airports located in the Himalayas, there's one considered to be the most challenging to land in the world. Only eight pilots on the planet are certified to do it. It's called Paro International Airport, and it's located in Bhutan, a landlocked country in the eastern Himalayas. First, landing there is so dangerous because you're literally flying through some of the world's tallest mountain peaks. Not to mention that those eight pilots also have to consider strong winds. Despite the challenges, they do manage to safely land over 30,000 people each year. Moving further, there's no radar there to guide the pilots, so they need to maneuver the aircraft entirely in manual mode. The pilots need to track their movements based on specific visual landmark checkpoints as they approach the runway. Moreover, flights are only allowed there during daylight hours and under good visibility. These pilots also need to watch out for utility poles and roofs on the hillsides too. It means they often squeeze their planes between mountain peaks at 45 degree angles before dropping quickly onto the runway. No wonder only two airlines fly to Paro International Airport. Apart from these commercial pilots, there are specially trained helicopter rescue pilots who spend most of their career at 20,000 feet in the sky. Most of the time, they partner with equally experienced climbers who train by crossing the Kumbu Icefall. It's dubbed the most dangerous square mile on the planet. 
Made up of ice pillars as tall as a six-story building, this huge stretch of the glacier on Everest's western side is filled with bottomless ice holes. It takes between 4 to 12 hours to get from one edge of the icefall to the other, depending on the experience of the climber. You may think it's a pretty serene location since you're literally only surrounded by ice and snow, but these local professionals claim otherwise. One Everest veteran said that the noise was actually the worst part of the job. The mountain produces awful squeaking sounds and sometimes even sighs. It often makes people feel like it's talking to them, warning them about the treacherous environment. Mount Everest isn't the only no-fly zone in the world. Surprisingly, Disney parks are also part of this exclusive club. So you won't ever be able to look out of your plane window and see the beauty of fairy tale castles from up above. In recent years, a lot of crowded tourist attractions, including Disney parks, have increased their security measures to make sure their visitors are as safe as possible. As such, no aircraft is allowed to fly within 3,000 feet of Disneyland in California or Walt Disney World in Florida. It was initially a temporary ban, but this rule became permanent back in 2003. Some other places don't have planes flying over them because of their historical importance, like Machu Picchu, located in the Peruvian Andes Mountains. There's also a large number of rare wildlife species and plants that grow exclusively in this area. It's crucial that they're protected as well as possible. What does it have to do with planes not flying over that area? Firstly, it reduces the volume of harmful chemicals in the area. Secondly, if a plane ever needed to perform an emergency landing in this location, it'd cause irreversible damage to buildings and wildlife. Surprisingly, planes can fly over the Greek Parthenon in Athens, but with one condition, not to get closer than 5,000 feet above it. This way, the historical building is kept a bit more protected from any emergency landings, since there are specially designated areas around it. You won't be able to see the Taj Mahal from above either, since it's one of the most important, oldest, and most beautiful pieces of architecture in the world. It also needs added security features. This building dates back to the 1600s. UNESCO announced it a World Heritage Site in 1983. The Indian authorities set up a no-fly zone above it in 2006. They did it to safeguard not only the building itself, but also the crowds of tourists that come there each year. 7 to 8 million people. Buckingham Palace is well known for being the residence of British monarchs. So, for the Queen's security, a no-fly zone was set up here too. Planes aren't allowed to fly over Windsor Castle either to make sure the royal family is equally protected. Other important British buildings with no-fly zones include Number 10 Downing Street, the British Prime Minister's official residence and office, and the Houses of Parliament. George Washington's home in Mount Vernon, Virginia, can only have planes flying above it at more than 1,500 feet. The historical wooden mansion was built for President George Washington between 1758 and 1778. Unfortunately, the building has seen a lot of damage over the years. So, in an effort to preserve it better, authorities decided to prohibit vibrations produced by flying aircraft. That's why another no-fly zone was established there. It covers the airspace above this National Historic Landmark. That's probably the reason why you'll rarely see pictures of this house from above. Since it's the resident of the US President, it's not allowed to fly over Washington, DC. It's also the home of Congress and other establishments. So, the authorities set a special flight rules area, stretching for 30 miles around Ronald Reagan International Airport. This means that it's one of the airports with the most precise takeoffs and landings. Pilots have to carefully tackle no-fly zones, which sometimes results in uncomfortable takeoffs for passengers. Whenever a pilot breaks a no-fly zone, it's a big problem, like the one that happened back in 2005 when a pilot accidentally steered the plane into a prohibited zone. The capital had to be evacuated immediately, and their regular activities were interrupted. Other capitals of the world have similar requirements, like Budapest, for example. In the capital city of Hungary, planes aren't allowed to fly over the ancient inner city of Pest and the Buda Hills. Almost all air traffic is generally prohibited above Paris, too, with some exceptions, aircraft flying no lower than 6,500 feet. 
flying helicopters are also a big no-no within the city limits. Only certain choppers undertaking precise missions can get special authorization. Generally, passenger planes aren't allowed near the island of Manhattan either, partly because of the really tall buildings there and the added risk of collision, but mostly because all three major New York airports, John F. Kennedy International Airport, Newark Liberty International Airport, and LaGuardia Airport are very close to each other, so the air traffic in the area has to be really well thought out to make sure the planes don't cross paths. Welcome to Ever City. It's a megapolis built inside a relatively young mountain. Everest is only about 55 million years old, but it's already the highest mountain in the world, 29,000 feet. Picture the Statue of Liberty. Now, uh -oh. imagine she had 83 twin brothers and sisters, and they were all standing on top of each other. If you wanted to get there back in the day, you had to pass some serious fitness tests, train for months, have perfect health, and spend a lot of money. Oh, and be a little crazy. Now that Mount Everest has been turned into a city, though, you don't need any of that stuff. Well, except money. Apartments here don't come cheap. It's easy to navigate around Ever City. The whole thing's basically six circles. It looks like a finger with six rings on it. The lowest and largest circle is the residential area. The highest and smallest ones near the top is where the richest people live. Below that is the meditation circle, then a circle for hotels, and two circles of pure entertainment. Ever City isn't built like an ordinary city. You won't find tall houses or six-lane highways here. Almost all buildings are built inside the mountain. At first, people were building ordinary houses, but strong icy winds and avalanches kept knocking them down. Then, engineers decided to build houses inside the mountain. They're connected by underground tunnels. From the inside, the mountain looks like a system of labyrinths. The entrance to Ever City is located at the foot of the mountain. Every day, hundreds of thousands of cars enter and leave the city. There's no factories or power stations inside. Electricity, gas, food, everything comes from the outside world. That's why all the stuff in Ever City's so insanely expensive. People want to keep the mountain covered in snow. That's another reason why there's no factories and stuff. There's almost no heating in the houses. People live here like they do in those ice hotels. But you don't need to go around wearing a bunch of layers. Designers created special thermal pants, socks, and t-shirts that go under your regular clothes. All that, plus jeans and a t-shirt, is totally enough to keep you toasty warm. To keep your face fresh, they've come up with a special cream. It warms and moisturizes your skin, and it's SPF 100, which is about what you'd need if you liked walking around on the top of Everest. Want to stop by a coffee shop, then grab a double bacon cheeseburger and maybe a slice of cheesecake? That'll set you back about $500. A movie ticket costs at least $100. And internet's so expensive, you'd have to pay about a dollar just to watch this video. Even so, more and more people are moving to Ever City every year. It's peaceful and quiet. You feel harmony and unity with nature. There's also a world-famous meditation center on its own special circle. People from all over the world come here to get their body and mind back into harmony. But the greatest draw is that you can visit the summit whenever you want, like it's your daily walk in the park. Before Ever City, conquering this mountain was extremely dangerous. There's three times less oxygen up there than in almost any other city. If your body doesn't get enough oxygen, you can find yourself in big problems. Climbers used to take oxygen tanks with them, which slowed them down and made everything more complicated. It's hard to get out of the way of an avalanche with huge metal cylinders on your back. Strong winds are a big problem, too. At the top, the wind can blow at 100 miles an hour. Try to nail one of those jumping selfies and you'll be blown clean off the mountain. It's so cold that icicles form on your hair and your skin gets covered with a thin crust of ice. And when you're up there, you have a special terrible superpower. A loud scream could cause an avalanche. But now, everything's chill. To get to the top of Everest, you just need to sit in a comfortable snowmobile capsule. It'll protect you from any bad weather or the odd avalanche. If you get covered with too much snow, you just turn on a powerful heater, wait a few for the snow to melt, 
and continue on your journey. Oxygen cylinders inside the cabin let you breathe normally. The new road to the top is well lit and there are signs everywhere, so you never get lost. The only problem is traffic. Every day, thousands of people want to visit the highest point on the planet. You might have to wait in line for several hours. But don't worry, all EverCity capsules are equipped with high-speed internet, an 8K screen, and game consoles. And if you get hungry, you can always order food, delivered by the latest AI robot snowmobile. You made it, so quickly find a parking spot, leave your capsule there, and head to the ski lift that'll take you straight to the top. Now, all you have to do is put on an oxygen mask and enjoy the view. While you're up there, you notice an ad inviting you to dine at the highest restaurant in the world, just 100 feet below the summit. It'll set you back around $10,000. Tempting, but you're not hungry. Feel like the king of the world. Dine with us at Best Food Ever Rest. Eh, pretty good ads, but you already feel like the king of the world. You scream with delight and... <laughs> Well, unfortunately, you just can't stay up there forever. There's not that much space at the top, so they only give you about a minute to enjoy the view. But it's okay, you can come back tomorrow. There are two ways back down the mountain. You can get in your capsule and drive home, or grab a snowboard and ride down. But before you rent some skis or snowboard, you need to show your Everest driver's license. It says if you've passed the special snowboard and skiing test, you take a snowboard and jet down a lit track. You zoom past the top of some houses sticking out just below the summit. That's where the wealthiest people live. They can just walk out their front doors and take a special elevator up to the top. You'd need to be a billionaire to have one of those houses, but there are over 2,000 of them right now, about half of them from the USA and China. Unfortunately, you live much lower down the mountain, but that has its advantages. The lower you live, the less you pay for food, entertainment, and electricity. You glide into the meditation center for a bit. A special ventilation system delivers air directly from the top of the mountain, plus a little added oxygen. You breathe in pure harmony. All six rings of Evercity have 360-degree views. And from way up there, all you can see is peaceful snowy mountains mixing with wispy clouds. After meditation, you head down to the entertainment rings. They've got it all. Coffee shops, any meal you can think of, shows, bowling, arcades, even an ice skating rink that's half inside, half outside the mountain. There are different gyms, but they all have one thing in common, sun baths. You lie down in a hammock or bed and curtains slide apart above your head. The sun shines through the sealed windows and you get a full dose of the purest sunlight on earth. Just five minutes, and you're ready for the rest of your day. If you don't want to go outside anymore, you can get home through the tunnels. They're not dark and cold, if that's what you're thinking. Evercity tunnels look like ice caves, lit up by hundreds of lights. It feels like a snowy fairy tale. After a short walk, you get to your apartment. It's compact, but cozy. To save money on electricity, you chose to go without a fridge. No problem. You keep your food in a little box just outside your window. The snow will keep it cold. With the help of a heating and filtration system, you get all the water you need from the millions of tons of snow on Everest. It's the cleanest water around. In the evening, you go down and watch a movie. There's an outdoor cinema at the foot of the mountain. At night, a huge machine projects movies directly onto the snowy surface of Everest. You watch the movie in capsules, either alone or in groups, kind of like a drive-in. Come on over! Visit Evercity any time of the year. There are many miles of undiscovered areas beneath the crust we can't even come close to. Scientists found what appears to be underground mountains buried inside the mantle. Our planet is divided into three layers, the crust, the mantle, and the core. The crust is where 8 billion people, trillions of trees, and millions of animals live and thrive. There are also different types of crust in the land and the ocean. The oceanic crust contains unique rocks and is denser than the land crust. We all see how the Earth is divided and color-coded to show the crust, mantle, and core in textbooks. But there are also special layers in between that not everyone talks about. 
the mantle, is divided into the upper and lower part, which is the transition zone. Since the mantle acts as the geological recycling center, the plate tectonics don't only move side to side, but up and down. It's actually why all the volcanoes appeared. The magma spews out to the surface or even underwater, and then sinks back down and repeats. The transitions go down 250 miles and then 410 miles. And in this bottom layer, scientists keep discovering the hidden landscapes. The mountains in the mantle are more rugged and much larger than the ones on the crust. Scientists found a mountain range with peaks higher than Mount Everest. Some of them are as high as 600 miles. When the continents were still landlocked together, there may have been some hidden lands now underwater. Theories suggest that Iceland used to be part of a larger microcontinent, Icelandia, which connected present-day Iceland with Greenland and Scandinavia. The idea digs even deeper to a greater Icelandia, which includes Britain. But after the split, these bigger lands sunk with everything in it. There are also theories about New Zealand being part of Zealandia, a hidden microcontinent within the same region. So it could be that these mountains used to be part of old Earth that are underground over the billions of years of natural occurrences, but still it isn't very likely. One theory is that these underground mountain ranges could be leftover slabs of rock that descended from the surface to the transition zone from the moving of the tectonic plates. As they sink, the large pieces break down into smaller ones, and as they compile over the millions of years, they form what appears to be underground mountains. Since the mantle is the geologic recycling zone, it's likely that the rocks down there used to be part of the surface. They weren't large pieces of land that got hidden, just like dogs hide bones in the garden, but it takes way more time to hide mountains. Some parts of the mantle appear to be smooth, while others aren't so much, the parts that have a cluster of rocks could contain hidden elements in the underground mountains. The smoother parts don't have much seismic or volcanic activity, while the rough parts do. The best way to study those underground landscapes is to wait for an earthquake or a volcano eruption to happen. Seismologists can observe the Earth's interior with special scanners, just like doctors use ultrasound to examine a patient. They can even see minor details and not huge chunks of rocks. A strong enough earthquake can send shockwaves to the Earth's interior, even through the core and back up to the surface. Depending on where they occur, seismologists can observe and study the intensity of the waves as they move back and forth. On smooth rocks, the waves can travel in a straight line, but once they reach a rough area, the waves tend to scatter. The temperature and composition of the materials can make the waves move faster or slower. But this info isn't exactly accurate and won't contribute a lot to the actual data of the underground mountains. So by analyzing the scattered waves on ships and utilizing the Earth's magnetic field, scientists can figure out everything they need to know. But these studies are only good enough to figure out the interior in today's state, not how the Earth changed over the past 4.5 billion years. However, scientists are certain that mantle material still dates back to the beginning of Earth's original formation. The question, why not just dig a hole to the center of the Earth and see what's going on down there, might seem logical. The deepest hole humans have dug so far is the Kola Deep Borehole in the Russian Arctic that goes more than 40,000 feet deep. The locals claim they can actually hear screaming coming from below. It took almost 20 years to drill as far as they went, but it's literally merely scratching the surface of what's underneath. They dug about one-third of the crust, which is only 0.2% to the center of the Earth. Getting there is beyond us, just like trying to reach the sun. No human can handle the amount of pressure down there. Going down the Mariana Trench, the Earth's deepest point, requires special gear to withstand all the immense pressure. It'll cost a fortune to build that tech to get us to the center of our planet. Evidence of diamonds buried deep in Brazil shows that everything we do on the crust's surface can affect things miles below, even towards the mantle. Scientists dug up six diamonds that could hold tiny mineral grains. 
as they're called in the mineral world, these inclusions have a chemistry composition where they originated deep in the Earth. Typical diamonds are formed at depths less than 125 miles in the upper mantle, where it's extremely hot. The high pressure and boiling temperature down crystallizes carbon and creates diamonds. But humans can't dig all the way down there. They mine them by detecting where a deep volcanic eruption happened that expelled these diamonds to the surface. These eruptions occurred millions of years ago, when dinosaurs used to rule the Earth. They shot out the diamonds that were in the mantle and are now embedded within the cooled down volcanic material. That's where people mine them. But these special diamonds found in Brazil originated from a much deeper point than usual, which can further help scientists study the depths of the Earth. They can extract these inclusions and analyze them in a lab to tell where exactly these minerals come from. In the lab, scientists study inclusions, each just 15 to 40 microns wide, less than a quarter width of a human hair. They found out that they contained many types of minerals found in volcanic rock on the surface. The carbon composition of the magma from the surface is much different than the ones deep in the Earth. What's crazy is that these diamonds with special inclusions can only be found 435 miles in the lower mantle. With only a few samples of them found, we don't know what else lies beneath us. It's possible that those mountain ranges underground, taller than Mount Everest, can have traces of diamonds all around, which would prompt excavators to dig them up and saturate the market with them. These diamonds are less flawed than the usual ones and might even come in many sizes. It's possible to see diamonds as large as a car or as small as a grain of rice. There might even be new diamonds with different chemical compositions than the ones we find near the surface. The largest diamond in the world is the Cullinan, which can fit in the palm of your hand. It weighs around 1.3 pounds and is 3,100 carats. It was found in 1905 in South Africa. For anything to exist on Earth, you need carbon. In a nutshell, the carbon cycle is when plants and algae release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere or dissolved in water through photosynthesis. It's converted into carbohydrates and stored as fat. Later on, carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere through breathing, which the plants benefit from, and the cycle goes on. Scientists claim that there might even be a carbon cycle in Earth's interior. The oceanic crust has a lot of carbon sediment that could mix with the upper and lower mantle layer. But there still isn't enough evidence to support this. The deep diamonds might be the key to popping open that theory. Only time will tell.